The environment is often a forgotten victim of war. Since the 1990s, maybe 10% of ceasefire agreements have had a substantive aspect of environmental peace building or environmental reconstruction. I uh, became particularly alerted uh, when I realized not just destruction, but devastation of land, water, and even air, it was it. Um, because of war fighting and weaponry and um, the effects this has on the civilians, but also the effect this can have on agriculture and fishing uh, and other areas. The Global Food and Water Security Project was created because there is a lack of research on armed conflict and the environmental impacts, particularly on food production and food security. My area of interest is mostly on pollution and how environmental pollution from warfare can lead to ecological effects. It can affect animals and plants in the ecosystem, but also human health effects, particularly if people are eating contaminated crops. Most work on conflict focuses on the immediate aftermath of conflict. It's saving human lives at the time, and then it's looking at rebuilding. Very little research looks at actually how we reconstruct the environment after conflict and how we ensure that that environment that might have been heavily contaminated from bullets and oils from tanks and barracks, how we actually remediate that contamination and remove it so that it doesn't end up in the human food chain. If projectiles, bombs, rockets, ordnances hit the ground and if the ground is soft and they don't explode, if they enter into a river, and they don't explode. This mixture will slowly sort of disseminate into the earth and enter the groundwater level. Groundwater travels for hundreds of miles and you can be really afar, nothing to do with the conflict. The moment you think you drink from uh, a freshwater well, you might drink quite some substance and uh, you might really be affected through contamination and pollution. Although we have several studies worldwide in different global conflict zones, probably one of the most comprehensive we have and unprecedented is in Ukraine. And my colleague Anastasia Spoditel collected hundreds of samples in the front line during active conflict, which is uh, very rare in terms of the sort of the data that we normally get from conflict zones. What we did with our samples was we tested for over 20 different contaminant elements, so metals, metalloid and other contaminants, and we found that the vast majority were elevated significantly in medium or high conflict intensity zones compared to no or low conflict. So we know that intense conflict causes pollution. This has a real generational impact because some of the pollutants, some of the heavy metals uh, and some of the um, contamination in the ground because of weaponry and because of ordnances, detonated and non-detonated, are highly poisonous, especially when they are differently concentrated, and have prenatal and postnatal effects. We have to begin thinking of mobilizing artificial intelligence and robotics to enhance the efficiency of decontamination and certainly demining and clearing and cleaning. So create conditions which permits people to be where they would like to be to help them get usable water, drinkable water, to help them have agriculture and feed themselves according to their cultural and other norms, that will not only make them happy and stay, but it will counteract migration. As part of the Global Food and Water Security Project, in the UK, I've set up the Armed Conflict and Environmental Research Programme, or ACER, at Canterbury Christchurch University. We have an incredible network of collaborators across the globe based on not just academics but also our own students from the ACER programme who are from a background in policy making, from NGOs, uh, from educators. 
who all bring something different to the table and all help understand better this broad issue of environmental impacts of war. I find it obligatory for us and certainly for people like me to try to help develop ways and strategies how to deal with the ramifications of conflict and war on the human level and also to turn food and water, which as we have seen now frequently, can be an instrument of war, can be weaponized, as we say, to make this an instrument of peace, of stability and of hope.